Hello, Shakespeare students. Uh, it's me, Professor Paul. Thank you for watching this video. Um, this is the first of some videos that I'll be putting up for our class while we are in our current quarantine situation. Uh, I just want to thank you again for um, your time and attention, your, your patience and fortitude during this very difficult period. Uh, we'll do our best to, to continue the class and, and keep it going as best we can through the rest of the semester. Uh, and I just appreciate, like I said, your, your uh, hard work and, and all your effort. In this presentation, I just want to conclude our discussion of uh, Much Ado About Nothing, um, some final thoughts about that, uh, also connecting it to some issues in Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, and then I hopefully think we'll uh, lay the groundwork for uh, Henry IV Part One and ultimately Macbeth. So uh, just to go back to Midsummer Night's Dream, um, one of the things that we talked about was the, the conflict in the story between desire, individual desire, specifically erotic desires, um, and restraint, uh, social and um, hierarchical restraints on that desire. And in one way, we might think about the, the story as fundamentally about that conflict between desire and control. Um, and a part of that uh, conflict is played out in the difference between fantasy and reality, right? Fantasy as an expression of uh, desire that is often forced to conform to reality in this play. So uh, remember Helena's first soliloquy at the end of Act One. She talks about love and the deforming aspects of love, right? She says that um, love looks uh, not with the not with the eyes, but with the mind. Therefore, is winged Cupid paint, painted blind, right? The idea that um, love is a mental state. It's not something that is based on empirical or sense evidence. It's based on uh, your fantasies, your imagination and desires. Um, she talks about how love transposes, transforms things that are base and vile into things that are noble, right? So um, what we perceive, desire transforms what we perceive into fantastical imagination, fantastical imagined imageries. Um, and this is what leads to misjudgment, right? The, the mistakes of love and uh, uh, forces, causes people to, to dote, to uh, idolize and idealize people and things that really are, are not all that wonderful, but because of their desire, because of their fantasies and their love that looks with their mind, transforms these things that they see into uh, other image, into false images, into false judgments. Helena's uh, talk about the difference between sight, uh, what we see and what we think we see, what's there and what we want to be there. Um, it seems to be confirmed in a certain way by Theseus's a declaration at the very end of the play uh, where he says, well, I never will believe uh, such strange fables, such antique fables, um, talking about the stories that the lovers say that they've experienced in the woods. Theseus doesn't believe it. He thinks that it's all fantasy. It's, it's shaping fantasies. And he contrasts that with cool reason. Uh, and he gives the image of the lover, the lunatic, uh, the poet, these beings, these people that, that project their desires into the world. They take, um, uh, the madman, for example, takes his fears and finds an object in the world to attach his fears to a shadow in the dark. And so he thinks the shadow of a bush is a bear because his fantasy, his imagination tells him that. So um, cool reason is what allows one to see reality without the uh, uh, impediment, without the false lens of desire covering it, right? Whereas shaping fantasies, they impose the mental image, they impose the mental shape, they impose the, the viewer's imagination on the reality that they see. So there's that opposition between cool reason, uh, which in Helena's language would be seeing what's actually there, seeing with the eyes rather than the mind. Um, Theseus is, is a little bit more sophisticated. He, this is a, a mental process that he's talking about, but he's still talking about a difference between what's really there, which cool reason allows you to apprehend, versus what's not there, what's only in your mind and projected there by your fantasies, by your imagination. 
the difference between Helena and Theseus's um, perceptions or their, their understandings of love um, is that for Helena, it's, it's, she seems trapped by it. Her expression is, you know, we, we can't see. If you're in love, you are trapped by that, by that love and you're not going to be able to see what's really there. Uh, you'll be blinded by it. Theseus um, also, again, acknowledges the power, obviously, of imaginations, but he does at least allow that cool reason can uh, control it, can put a lid on it, right? There is, it's a difficult boundary to maintain. It's difficult to maintain one's cool reason um, in the face of our desires and our fantasies, but um, it's something that, that he suggests can be done with res restraint, with careful um, restraint and practice. One can maintain the difference between one's reason and one's fantasies, one can manage the way you interpret the world, one can uh, uh, protect uh, oneself from being absorbed or being, being misled by your own fantasies, and reasonably apprehend the world. And despite their, their subtle differences, both uh, Helena and Theseus presume a difference between perception what we perceive and what we imagine that we see, and they and they draw a distinction between the two. Uh, there is a third position, however, that seems to to upset that difference between perception and imagination, and that position is um, is uh, uh, occupied by Oberon. Uh, remember the flower, the love and idleness flower that he uses to uh, enchant Titania and also Demetrius and uh, Lysander. The flower, he talks about how it's a flower that was wounded. Cupid was shooting his dart at a um, an enthroned virgin, obviously Queen Elizabeth, uh, but it was deflected and it hit this flower, which uh, being wounded by Cupid's um, arrow, took on some of the, the properties of Cupid's arrow, took on the properties of love, right? So, uh, and this idea of, the, of being wounded, that's a very common, familiar, image for the experience of erotic desire or love, that it is a wounding of oneself. You're wounded by the sight, uh, by the desire you feel for the other and the pain of not possessing them. Remember the story of the flower of love and idleness. Uh, Cupid was aiming at an enthroned virgin queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth, obviously is the, the reference here. Uh, but Oberon says he saw o uh, Cupid aiming at a, at a uh, virgin queen. His arrow was deflected, of course, by her immense power of, of virginity and purity, and in its deflection, it landed and, and hit a flower. Um, so uh, flowers, of course, have a very common and longstanding association with love and sexuality. Flowers, roses as objects of uh, uh, symbols of love, but also the image of being deflowered, of that as a, a, the loss of virginity. We might remember that... Um, uh, Bottom mistakenly says in the play at the end when he's when he's performing his pyramus he mistakenly says that uh, Thisbe has been deflowered by a lion mistakenly uh, saying instead of devoured uh, but so the flower um, you know has a long standing association with sexuality and love and in this story that Oberon tells we see the flower taking on the love wound it takes the wound that was uh, intended for the queen. Uh, the flower takes it in itself. And this image of being wounded by Cupid or love, desire as a kind of wound, is, is a really common one in the period, and medieval period and, and up through the, the Renaissance. Uh, the idea that love is a, um, uh, is a, with the image of Cupid's arrow, it's like a penetration. One has been pierced by the desire for another. Uh, and the feeling of loss, the feeling of separation from that person is, is a kind of um, uh, bittersweet pain. So the image of the wounded flower as, uh, uh, is, is an embodiment of the, the love experience in this physical object. So Oberon takes the juice of love, the love in idleness flower and he applies it to the eyes of the various lovers. The eyes, of course, uh, an important um, image throughout this poem, and traditionally Im very important in, in love poetry, the eye as the, the vector through which love travels. One is wounded in the eye, this, the vision of the loved one enters through the eye, and that is how one uh, uh, falls in love. 
And so, of course, it's the eyes that he applies it to. Uh, and there's a kind of act of sympathetic magic here. The, the love wound that the uh, flower has experienced and, and embodies, uh, that wound is transferred in a kind of osmosis and almost a kind of mimicry into the eyes and the spirits of the lovers, right? So they uh, take on the attributes of the flower. The flower has that wound and then it's, it's transferred into them in a kind of sympathy. Let's take a second to uh, think about the name of the flower, love in idleness, right? So idleness is, it's, it's love that is waiting. It's love that is just sitting there waiting to be deployed. Um, it's the emotion already exists. Uh, it just is searching for an object to attach itself to. And idleness, uh, the word idle, I-D-L-E, there's also a pun there on idol, I-D-O-L, uh, a false god or a false image that one worships. And idolatry is a figure in this poem, uh, in this play a number of times for a kind of um, uh, uh, over, overly emotional or overly invested or, or foolish love. Helena is talked about as doting in idolatry on Demetrius, and she seems to acknowledge that herself because Demetrius isn't all that great, right? So he's not truly... Uh, uh, he's not the true, uh, truly wonderful being that she thinks he is. He's an idol. She's, he's an image that she has uh, infused with her own desires. So he's like a false god, so to speak. Um, and I think that that pun and the idea of that this is idol love, love that is waiting to be um, uh, attached to something, um, it suggests that uh, the di difference between perception and conception, the difference between seeing something and, and having that sense impression, and then the way we think or feel about that, both Helena and Theseus suggest that there at least can be a difference, right? You can see something, but your mind will transform it unless, Theseus says, you are using cool reason. But the idea of the love and idleness flower, um, I think it upsets that idea. And, and again, by the fact that it's applied to the eyes, it suggests that there really is no difference between perception and conception. It's not that we see something and then we transform it. Uh, it's that our vision is always already wounded. That is, we always, uh, it's always the case that, that our desire is already there waiting to be attached. Um, it's not that only occasionally uh, it, it overpowers our cool reason, but rather that all of our sense perceptions, everything that we see has already been shaped by our desires. It's already been made into some kind of idol, I-D-O-L, um, that the world we see around us is not the world as it is, but it's always the world filtered through our own fantasies and desires. So to sum up, um, the love and idleness flower and Oberon, uh, Oberon's use of it, it dismantles the difference between sensory perception and fantasy, dismantles the idea that there's a distinction between cool reason and shaping fantasies, that there's a distinction between what the eyes see and what the mind sees, right? So it's not a matter of how we interpret what we see, but rather our sight is always already compromised. It's always already shaped by our fantasies, by our desires, by our fears, by our anxieties. Uh, we're always shaping it into a world in which we can invest our fantasies. Um, so we're always making it into, in some sense, what we want it to be or perhaps what we fear it to be. And this idea, I think it puts Puck's epilogue in a, a different light, an interesting light. Um, in the epilogue, he says, if we spirits have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these spirits did appear. Or something very close to that, right? The idea is, if you didn't like the play, just tell yourself that you were dreaming, that it was all a dream, and then it won't be so big a deal. Uh, so in a sense, I think he's making us responsible for our own enjoyment or our lack thereof. What we see in the play, whether we like it or not, has less to do what's there on stage with the words of the play or the actions, but with our own desires, our own fears, fantasies, anxieties, right? Um, as Bottom says when he's first transformed and Quince looks at him and says, Bottom, what, what's happened to you? Bottom says, you see an asshead of your own, 
right? So if we see something, if we see foolishness, if we think this play is a bunch of foolish nonsense and these people are all so immature and stupid and blah, 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 or whatever, we, however we might react, um, Puck's epilogue is saying, well, that's, that's your fault, isn't it, right? That's your problem. Uh, the foolishness you see is not the foolishness of the characters, but it's your own foolishness reflected back at you. Um, so it's a, a it's a very uh, clever way, perhaps, to avoid bad reviews, uh, but also it, I think, really encapsulates that idea of fantasy, that fantasy is at the root of this play, that this play is about how fantasy, in fact, uh, often shapes what we think is reality. And so this takes us now to Much Ado About Nothing which, of course, is also a play about fantasy and misunderstanding and how um, uh, we project our own anxieties, fears uh, onto the world around us rather than seeing what's really there. Um, just a, a couple uh, distinctions between the plays I want to note. Um, the, in Midsummer Night's Dream, the plot is, is far more conventional in a certain sense, right? The conflicts are very familiar, um, and they're relatively impersonal, right? Um, it's basically about the old versus the young, uh, an old man who is standing in the way of young love. Um, and the characters are largely interchangeable with each other, and not just Hermia, Helena, Demetrius, and Lysander, who are, um, you know, more of character types than real characters, but none of the characters in the play, uh, outside of perhaps maybe Puck, um, have too much of a sense of, of individual personality. They, they are character types to a certain extent. Um, much Ado About Nothing, which shares many of the play's same concerns as, as Midsummer Night's Dream, um, I would say it's a much more psychologically and socially deep story, uh, play, right? Uh, there's more psychological and social depth. Uh, while the conflicts that we see in the play are cultural, culturally and narratively familiar, right? The unjust uh, accused woman, the bitter uh, outsider who wants to throw a wrench into everyone else's happiness. These are all conventional story elements. Um, there's far greater individuality with these characters, especially with Beatrice and Benedict, um, we get the sense of real people with, with real emotions, real psychology behind their actions. So they aren't just uh, the kind of stock figures that I think um, we see in Midsummer Night's Dream or, or stock figures that are just slightly more developed, slightly more advanced in Midsummer Night's Dream. Much ado, these characters are far closer to, to real people, I think. And so they're both about fantasy and misunderstanding, um, in Midsummer Night's Dream, the misunderstandings are generated by magic, right? It's an outside source that, that comes in to cause chaos in the story. Uh, but in Much Ado About Nothing, the fantasies, the misunderstandings, the complications and conflicts, they're all generated within this society itself. They're generated by the characters in their world. It's not something that's imposed upon them from outside. So their conflicts are all a result of their own miscommunications and mistrust, not uh, uh, the result of some fairy magic that's imposing itself from a supernatural realm. This, these are humans dealing with human problems that they've caused themselves. As I mentioned in class before, uh, throughout this play, Hero, through much of it, is a blank slate. Um, we see her being active and talkative in a few scenes, but in much of the play, particularly in the scenes where there are male characters, Hero is pretty silent. Uh, and so as a silent character, she, she is the blank slate upon which other characters, most particularly Claudio, uh, project their fantasies and anxieties. Right, so at the very beginning of the play, first Pedro asks about her, Don Pedro asks, is this your daughter, right? And there's the joke about her parentage. Uh, but then after uh, Don Pedro and, and uh, Leonardo leave the stage for a moment, Claudio asks Benedict about her, right? What do you think of this woman? Do you think she is fair? Do you think she's honest? Do you think she'd be a good wife? He doesn't come out and say things quite that explicitly, but he's, you know, he's clearly enamored of her. But... He wants to get uh, someone else's judgment, right? He looks to the older soldier, the senior, uh, who perhaps he looks up to for guidance, for understanding. He doesn't quite trust what he sees, so he asks for Benedict's opinion so we can compare. Uh, and there's also, I think, some concern here in terms of well, what is Benedict going to think about him? So he lacks the skill uh, and knowledge 
necessary to to woo her but he's also displays his insecurity here right um he is not sure about his own appearance he's also not sure about how to decipher her appearance both of these are signs i think of his uh immaturity that he still has a long way to go he still has a lot to learn about how to interpret and judge the world around him and of course claudio uh, approaches Hero through a proxy, through the figure of Don Pedro, who woos him, who woos her on his behalf. Um, so it's another sign, I think, of his vulnerability, or his, excuse me, his insecurity, his uh, lack of experience, his lack of confidence in himself. Um, but it's also this uh, reliance on the judgments of others and the way he uses others to, to both interpret the world and to, uh, uh, pursue his desires that makes him vulnerable to misinformation, that, that makes him vulnerable to the trickery that Don John um, plays. And uh, Don John's two plots, they, they play on Claudio's insecurities um, and uh, in particular, very related to very related problems, the problem of male rivalry and the problem of female infidelity, which are intimately connected with each other, right? The rivalry rivalry between men over women, which we've seen in, in Midsummer Night's Dream, Lysander and Demetrius, their rivalry over uh, Hermia, um, and the, the fear of female infidelity, the fear that the woman will be unfaithful, um, that behind the appearance of chastity and purity and, and good morals, etc., cetera, is um, a dangerous, lascivious, uh, uh, dark woman. Um, and we see the, the cuckold humor throughout the play is a way, um, perhaps one way that this society, these characters try to negotiate that problem of uh, the problem of their anxieties over love and uh, male rivalry and female infidelity. So Don John's first plot um, is deals with the, the problem of male rivalry, right? Your friend Don Pedro has actually wooed this woman uh, on your behalf, for himself, not on your behalf. Um, and of course, Claudio, given that Don Pedro is higher in status, can't really do much but be angry at him. Uh, of course, this quickly falls apart because these men are quite closely bonded to each other, right? Um, the the rivalry, the the uh, uh, whatever Don John had hoped to accomplish, very quickly dissolves. His plot quickly dissolves when Don Pedro says, "No, I wooed her for you." So it's it's an easy problem to overcome, partly because the men do have relationships with each other. They have a close bond. So this, uh, whatever falsehood that Don John tries to insert to break up that, that male bonding uh, is very quickly discovered as false, right? The second plot though, is the one that plays on fears of female infidelity. And this is the one that works because uh, Claudio, it, it, it it breaks whatever potential trust between Claudio and Hero there might have been. Um, and so it makes the very act of reconciliation, Don Pedro and Claudio can reconcile because Claudio believes what Don Pedro says, and Don Pedro is his superior. But once Claudio mistrusts Hero, he's never going to hear what she says, right? And of course, as we see, um, when he accuses her, the more she protests her innocence, he just interprets it as signs of her falseness, right? So the second plot is much more effective because it plays on a basic lack of communication between the male and the female, between this uh, world of male soldiers and uh, uh, male-male bonding and the domestic world in which Hero lives. And the strength of Don John's plot is that he tells Pedro and Claudio just enough just enough to get them suspicious, just enough to give Claudio uh, enough rope to hang himself, so to speak, enough suspicion so that Claudio convinces himself. He doesn't say she's done X, Y, and Z. He says, well, I'm gonna show you. I don't even have the words to tell you what she's done, just see for yourself. But trust me, you will be very upset with it, right? So he raises the specter of suspicion, but he leaves it tantalizingly unsaid so that they have to fill in the details themselves. And the scene that he shows them of uh, Baraccio uh, wooing uh, Hero's maid Margaret, 
in Hero's clothing, and she calls herself Hero. Um, that's not actually in the text, right? We don't see it. We don't see what Claudio sees. Uh, but it is often staged by um, either in stage plays or in films. And um, it's often staged, I think, to, uh, because depending on how it's staged, it affects our relationship to or, or our feelings about Claudio. If it's staged very realistically, that is where it really does look like from wherever Claudio's standing, if it looks very believable that this is Hero uh, talking with or doing something else with someone else, um, then we can perhaps sympathize with him or at least understand, okay, that looks bad. I can understand why he might fall for it. That doesn't mean we sympathize with the actions that he chooses to take, but we could perhaps see why he might at least believe that Hero has been unfaithful. On the other hand, if the scene is staged very unconvincingly, if it's staged where it's pretty obvious that it's not Hero, um, or that it would only take you know a moment more paying attention uh, or slightly closer uh, attention to the scene to figure out, well, that's not really Hero, then that makes uh, that really highlights his rashness um, and his mistrusting nature, and it makes us find Claudio a more distasteful character. But you know, in some sense, it doesn't really matter um, whether the scene is staged or not, whether it's believable or not, because, you know, once Claudio opens himself up to the to the possibility, once he listens to Don John just even saying, come with me, I'll take you to to show you something terrible about your, your beloved, your betrothed, he's already compromised himself. He's already, in some sense, uh, convinced himself just by being open to the suspicion by not saying immediately to Don John, you're lying, or saying, okay, well, I'm going to go and ask Hero about this right now, right? The very fact that he even plays along enough to go and spy um, already raises for us the, the fact that, or, or shows us that Claudio is mistrusting, whether it's because he's a jerk or just because he's insecure, doesn't, you know, that that depends on the, the way the actor's playing him. But whether it's realistic or not, that's not the point. The point is that this character, like all the characters in the play, um, is controlled not by rational thought, but like all humans, is moved by his emotions, his desires, his fears, his anxieties, his fantasies, right? That that is what uh, causes Claudio to act the way he acts, uh, and that's what causes him to make much ado about nothing. The point is that, that Claudio fashions what he sees into what he fears. His anxieties turn nothing into something through an act of observation, through an act of, of noting. Um, and that's also why when the accusations are made public at the wedding, uh, Don John is very quick to avoid any details, right? He says that there's not enough chastity and language to utter what she's done. So by leaving it unsaid, it plays upon the imaginations of the, the audience members, both audience members in the actual audience and the other people at the wedding, right? They fill in the blanks with their own fears. And um, it's powerful enough to even sway Leonato to believe that his own daughter has been faithful, right? That anxiety about female infidelity and female lasciviousness is so strong that it infects even the father himself. So this phenomenon that we see in uh, Claudio's actions, this phenomenon of uh, shaping what you see into what you fear, um, it's echoed, of course, in a more comic vein in the scenes where Beatrice and Benedict are, are gulled, where they're tricked into falling in love with each other. Um, they provide a lighthearted example of another form of misunderstanding. And um, the irony is that uh, throughout the play, people um, repeatedly misinterpret each other, right? They misinterpret others' intentions by mishearing, overhearing things. Uh, and Beatrice and Benedict, they also display how one can misunderstand oneself. They both, uh, both these characters, they constantly talk about how disdainful they are towards marriage. Neither of them um, have any interest in getting married, so they say they both find the, uh, the marriage to be a, a kind of enslavement. Um, they both continually express their disdain for each other. Um, yet, Neither of them can cease talking about each other. All they talk about is love 
and how much they hate this other person, right? Benedict in particular, in his scene when he is gold, he goes on at length about his disdain for monogamy. And each time he concludes and says, nope, not going to be me. Uh, then he starts up again. He says, well, you know, so he continually, uh, it's like he's almost trying to convince himself that he doesn't want to fall in love. He keeps saying, I can't believe anyone would fall in love. I'm never going to do that. Well, if it was, it'd be this kind of woman, but I'm never going to do that. But, et cetera, et cetera, right? So he's almost convincing himself. Uh, and notably, when he hears the, the story, when he overhears Claudio and Leonardo and Don Pedro talking about how Beatrice is supposedly in love with him, um, what convinces him that it's real, he says, this, this totally would, I, I would never believe this, except the old man, the white, the gray beard is saying it, right? So it's the show of his pranksters that, that convinces him because this old man is saying it. Well, the old man's got to be telling the truth because an old man wouldn't, wouldn't be a liar, would he? Um, he's critiqued in his scene, Benedict is critiqued for being too prideful and that Beatrice is too sensitive, that she's so sensitive that she's hurt by his, his pride and his cruel words. Beatrice, for her part, is also critiqued for her mockery and her disdainful tongue towards Benedict. Um, so both of them must become more quote unquote conventional before they can be, uh, before their conflict can be resolved and before they can find love. He has to become less of what he calls himself a professed tyrant to women. He has to be less of a womanizer and just less cruel about women. And she has to be less of a quote unquote shrew. She has to be less uh, bitter and, and antagonistic towards men and more womanly. And this suggests a transformation between them the transformation of Beatrice and Benedict, their personal transformations. Uh, of course, it's important for their the resolution of their subplot, but it's also crucial for resolving the plot of Claudio and Hero. And we see this after the abortive marriage, after the, the crisis moment when um, Claudio shames Hero in front of the whole congregation. Um, after that ceremony, Benedict makes a very important choice, which is, when Don Pedro and Claudio and Don John leave, the men, the male soldiers leave um, as a group, Benedict stays. He stays with Hero and with Beatrice. So he makes the decision to break off from that all-male society of soldiers and, you know, uh, the boys club, the men behaving like men with each other and the rough kind of life that, that, that those kind of guys would, would live. He breaks that all-male military fraternity um, that had defined him so far uh, and what he had complained about regarding Claudio. He says, Claudio used to be a real man's man. He used to only be interested in armor and, and war, but now he's interested in all these feminine and love uh, domestic things. Now that's happened to Benedict. And it also uh, leads at this time in the scene to Beatrice's acknowledgement of her social limitations as a woman. Throughout the play, she has been um, uh, as powerful, if not more powerful, than the men when it, came, when it comes to her wit. But she can't revenge her cousin. She can't avenge Hero's shaming on Claudio because she's a woman. She doesn't have the authority or the social uh, 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 right, perhaps, to challenge Claudio. So they both need each other in this moment. So this takes us at last to the, the resolution in Act 5. Um, as I've said in class, at the end of Shakespeare's plays, he often returns to the beginning, right? There's a kind of cyclicality to it. Uh, Claudio and Don Pedro, who had started off this play as, you know, men's men, soldiers, good old boys, lads, uh, boys being boys, they go back to that, that kind of attitude, that kind of behavior, this, the, the masculine bonding, the joking, the one-upsmanship comes back at the end of this play. Um, and there, with that is a certain cruelty. Leonardo and Antonio approach them. They say, you know, Leonardo says, you killed my daughter with your slander. They challenge Claudio and Don Pedro, but they're laughed off. Claudio and Don Pedro just laugh at this, and they don't seem to care that Hero has died. Now, perhaps this can be performed as if they're, they're hiding it, they're bottling it up, he, that maybe Claudio is upset and he feels guilty, but he doesn't want to show it because, well, yeah, it's too bad she died, but she was unfaithful in his mind still, right? 
Um, but then when Benedict comes on stage, they try to return to their joking, friendly behavior earlier. And they joke around with Benedict, but he's not joking with them. He challenges Claudio. He says, I'm not going to take part in your jests. I'm sorry, Don Pedro. I cannot follow you anymore. Um, and he breaks in. He breaks, again, that, that male, all-male military fraternity. And he challenges them. Uh, with his jet, with his, with, by refusing to participate in their joking, he challenges them to take responsibility for their actions. And it's critical here that whereas Claudio and Don Pedro, their actions had been uh, in, in the previous act when they had shamed Hero, it had been to preserve their own honor, right? They didn't want to be, uh, Claudio was embarrassed that he had been uh, betrothed to a, a wanton stale, as he calls her. And Don Pedro is humiliated that he had possibly was, was attaching his friend to this unworthy woman. So it had, about, it had been about their honor and their reputations. Benedict here is not concerned about his reputation, though, or he's not acting to pre preserve his own reputation. He's acting on behalf of someone else. And he's acting on behalf of a wronged woman. So this is a kind of very, you know, almost stereotypically the, the classic chivalric gentlemanly action to challenge another man on behalf of a woman's honor, not on behalf of his own honor. Uh, and this is particularly uh, notable because throughout Benedict has been, you know, he talks about how much, uh, how men who fall in love or men who are uh, uh, in love with women are deserving of ridicule, right? The cuckold jokes that, that men come in for and that he makes plenty of. Um, now he's not concerned about male reputation. Right? He's only concerned about doing what's right for Hero and Beatrice, his love. And Claudio, notably, isn't convinced. Even when Benedict challenges him, he's still not convinced that he's done anything really wrong. Right? He might feel like it's too bad that Hero is dead, but still, ultimately, he was the one who was wronged by her, in his mind. Uh, he's not convinced until Boraccio. Right. Uh, and so it takes the word of a man and ironically of a criminal, the criminal who set Hero up to change Claudio's mind. And there's also the irony here that it's brought to him, this word that's brought to him by Dogberry, the fool. Right. So it's the foolish constable who's been so ineffectual in his job thus far that serves as the vehicle for um, the the truth that ultimately transforms Claudio and leads to the happy ending of the play. Um, so Claudio has to be convinced by a man that Hero is, is uh, 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 honest. And at this moment, he says the image that he had had of her reappears in the semblance that he had once loved. So the image that he had seen of her returns to him the way he'd wanted to imagine her when he first saw her. The fantasies about how beautiful and perfect she has, she was, return, and they replace, they erase those uh, fantasies or anxieties he'd had of her as a wanton woman, as a lascivious, unfaithful uh, uh, cheater. So the penance that Claudio is assigned, it's a kind of formal symbolic rewriting of Hero's chastity. It's, uh, it's a destruction an erasure of the slander that he had spoken and makes uh, her, uh, rewrites her chastity, her purity, literally monumentalized, literally inscribed as a permanent marker in this tomb, right? So this is, is, is noted down for all time that in fact, Hero was pure, Hero was chaste. So her virginity, her chastity, her good name is rewritten, is reinscribed and literally made into a monument. Of course, the question is, can it ever be undone, right? Um, is the marker of her chastity still also the marker of doubt in that chastity, right? And that's one of the things that this play, even though at the end of it, there is this reconciliation, um, this is a play about just how mutable signs can be, that every sign, even signs of virtue, can be interpreted as their opposite. So, um, this monument that's made to Hero at the end is held up as a monument to, to preserve her, her purity, but it also preserves the fact that she was slandered. So it's a kind of double-edged sword, so to speak. When Claudio accepts 
the veiled woman as his wife. It's a ceremonial humbling, uh, a ceremonial redemption, much like the monument scene um, and the singing of the prayers before Hero's grave. Um, mar being married to a woman that he can't see symbolically redeems him and reverses his earlier crimes, his, his wrongdoings against Hero. Uh, because what had gotten into tr him into trouble before was what he saw, that he saw something and he misinterpreted it. He let his fantasies, uh, he got carried away with by his fantasies and he let them transform what he saw. So by marrying the veiled woman, he's abjuring his sight. He's uh, he's not relying on vision. He's, he's leaving that aside and he's just trusting. He's just trusting what he's given. Um, he cannot project his fears onto the veil. It's a kind of screen that blocks her from his vision and also from his fantasy slash fear. So he has to learn to trust, right? He learns to trust even what he can't see or what he can't know. And this is a very important moment for him as a man that he has to trust the unknown that is his wife, this other being who has a life and a mind and a set of desires and, and ideas and passions that he can't have access to. He has to learn to trust that if she says, I love you, if she says, I'm your faithful wife, if she appears as that, he has to just learn to trust it and accept it. And the question that we might ask now is, just as with the monument, does the monument truly erase the slander that had been leveled against Hero? Does this act of, of marrying the veiled woman, does that erase all suspicion as, as Claudio really turned a corner to become a trusting person? Um, and we might have some lingering doubts about that because, again, another thing that returns at the very end of the play are cuckold jokes. And it seems really odd to joke about female infidelity after resolving a near tragic situation, a near tragic death based on false assumptions of female infidelity, right? It's why would you joke about something that was just such a serious issue that almost led to death, that almost led to violence, that almost led to you know conflict between friends and lovers? Why would you joke about such things? You know, why would you joke about the very thing that just caused you so many problems? Um, there's a couple different responses to this. This could be a form of gallows humor, right? The way that we often joke about the things that fear that we fear the most as a way to deal with them. I'm sure there's a lot of humor out there right now about the coronavirus, right? Um, we laugh at our suffering as a way to deal with it. And perhaps that's that's what's going on here. Uh, or perhaps it's a sign that this problem that has been resolved for the time being is an ongoing problem, right? In all of Shakespeare's comedies, even the most festive ones like Midsummer Night's Dream, there's still some lingering issues at the end. Well, hmm, yeah, we've resolved it now, but is this problem solved for all time? Are we going to keep having problems of trust between men and women? Are the lingering cuckold jokes uh, evidence that we haven't truly conquered the issue? We've only put it to bed for a little bit. We've temporarily eased the conflict, but we're going to come back to it again. There is a third and a more hopeful way, I think, to also read this return of cuckold humor at the end of the play. Um, for the main characters in this play, Claudio, Benedict, Beatrice, all of them experience false beliefs. They are victims of their own mistakes uh, and the false ideas they have about themselves and about other people. And those false beliefs lead them down bad pathways, lead them down the wrong paths to, in, in especially in Claudio's case, near tragedy. Uh, but when the truth is revealed, and those false beliefs are overturned, there's a redemption. There's a kind of conversion. Their, their, their beliefs change, they see the truth, and they change in response to that. So it's we might call these conversion narratives. This is a story about conversion, how one is converted from false belief into true belief. And even though this play um, doesn't deal explicitly with religious topics, there is still, it is still a play that emerges within the context of Reformation theology. And one of the most important ideas 
beliefs in Reformation theology was the idea that human knowledge, human reason, is always going to be insufficient in the face of the mystery of God's creation. Um, and that one of the first steps to the path of, of grace and redemption is to acknowledge our own ignorance, to acknowledge our own insufficiency, um, that, that we are helpless and that we have to rely on and trust in God, trust in God's plan, trust in God's truths in order to survive, in order to live good lives. So the cuckold humor could, in, in a sense, be taken as uh, a kind of humorous uh, version of that same idea, that we are helpless. Our reason, our knowledge is always going to be insufficient. There's always more in the world around us than we can ever uh, apprehend or comprehend. And that in order to live, in order to, to have any sort of happiness or grace, uh, to have any kind of reconciliation with others around us, we have to learn to trust. We have to learn that maybe there are things going on that we don't know. Maybe there are uh, uh, desires or sins that we can't see in others, but we don't have really any other choice but just to live our lives and to trust in those that we love, trust that they love us, trust that they will be good to us and be good to them. The man, uh, a married man is always going to be at some, in some sense, at the mercy of his wife's uh, fidelity, right? Um, there's always the possibility that something's going on that he doesn't know. And vice versa, of course. Uh, Shakespeare's writing in a, a male-dominated culture, and he's writing largely from male perspective, so he focuses, of course, on the male experience. But um, all of us, we are all at, at the mercy of those around us. We never really know uh, if we can fully trust those people around us. The husband always has to ultimately just hope that his wife is being faithful, to trust in her, um, and I think we're uh, we're enjoined at the end of this play. The characters, at least, are enjoined to go ahead and 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 trust each other. And yes, the ga the cuckold humor is a form of of uh, gallows humor, a way to ward off anxiety. But I think it's also an acknowledgement that yes, we are imperfect human beings. The world is imperfect. We will make mistakes. We will be flawed. People might uh, hurt you. People might betray you. But what can we do? We can live like Don John, always bitter and always hateful, or we can try to be trusting. We can uh, make the choice that Benedict and Beatrice make, which is, well, the world must be peopled, right? Love, we, we want to be loved, um, and it is better to experience that love and perhaps be hurt by it than to never experience any love at all. So in that sense, the husband uh, and and the husband's uh, uh vulnerability to his wife is a kind of figure for all humanity's vulnerability, weakness, insufficiency before God and before God's power. Before I conclude, let me just say a couple of things um, trying to connect Midsummer Night's Dream and Much Ado About Nothing to Henry IV Part I. Now, the first two plays, of course, they're comedies, so they their main focus is on love and romance. Uh, the history plays, they are have very little focus on romance. Uh, some of them do have marriages in them, but by and large, these are plays that are focused on politics and war. Um, that said, issues of fantasy and honor do come up in Henry IV Part I and connect, them, connect it to the earlier plays. Uh, in Much Ado About Nothing, it's honor that motivates Claudio and Don Pedro to shame Hero. Claudio feels that his reputation has been tainted because the woman that he is betrothed to has been unfaithful. So her uh, infidelity shames him. In uh, Henry IV Part I, honor is also going to, to be a big issue. Uh, the king, uh, Henry IV, is dismayed at, his behavior, at the behavior of his son, Hal, who behaves dishonorably, who is out partying and hanging, hanging out with uh, undesirables. Compared to the character of Henry Percy Hotspur, who is the king's main rival, who is a character devoted to honor, devoted to uh, military uh, achievement, right? He, he embodies the chivalric code. Um, and just as in Much Ado About Nothing, that obsession with honor uh, in King Henry IV is also shown to be somewhat hollow. 
Uh, and in particular, in Henry IV, Part One, it'll be the character of Falstaff, who shows um, that honor, in, in a, as he says in a noted speech near the end of the play, he says it's just a word. And honor can't help you if you've got a broken leg. Honor can't heal your wounds. Uh, if you die in battle, people might say you're honorable, but what does it matter? You're dead. Uh, and so just as Claudio and Don Pedro's pursuit of honor leads them to, to wrong hero and potentially you know, nearly go down a, a very tragic uh, path, um, Hotspur's devotion to honor, his pursuit of honor, is ultimately what leads to his death and his, uh, at the hands of Prince Hal and the end of his rebellion. So I think both plays, uh, and again, in the character of Falstaff in Henry IV, um, it, it also uh, challenges or it, it, it uh, uh, punctures, it undermines the sense of, of honor and appearance, right? And, and causes us to be skeptical about some of the values, the stereotypical or, or uh, common values that, that our culture or society holds up um, as the most important. All right. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and conclude the video now. Um, I want to remind you all, uh, to those of you who are my students, please go ahead and take the Blackboard survey uh, about your availability online. I want to determine uh, the feasibility of conducting live online classes while we are on quarantine. Um, and I also just want to thank you all for your patience, your fortitude, your perseverance during this very difficult time. I know it's, it's very stressful and scary None of us have ever seen anything like what's going on right now in the world. Uh, and I know that it can seem a little absurd to be talking about classwork, to be talking about plays and poems and so forth. And I do acknowledge to feeling a bit absurd myself, you know, writing lectures, grading essays and so forth. Uh, but I think one, it is good in times like this, in times of crisis, to have a little bit of normalcy, to have a little bit of routine, to take your mind off all the crazy stuff that's going on and, and to give you something else to think about, something else to focus on. Uh, but I also think that in times of crisis, this is when art is, is most important because it allows us to get outside of our own heads, to get outside of our limited perspective and, and hopefully gain some perspective on the world around us. Um, and as much as possible as we continue uh, in the, the weeks that remain in the semester, I will try to do my best to connect what we're, what we're talking about in class to the world around us. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say is just Shakespeare himself was no, uh, no stranger to plagues and pandemics. Um, the Black Death that had, uh, you know, terrorized Europe for centuries um, was still going on and, and still periodically closed down uh, the London city, the city of London, closed down London stages uh, during Shakespeare's career before and after his time. Uh, and oftentimes during the plague, uh, when, when the theaters were closed down, that was when Shakespeare got some of his writing done. He wrote his sonnets, likely during plague years. He wrote uh, King Lear, perhaps his masterpiece, during uh, a plague. So um, art can also be a good um, uh, escape, uh, something to focus on, something to put our energies into in times of trouble. Um, so with that said, uh, I want to again thank you for watching the video. Please contact me if you have any questions about anything I've talked about here or any other issues with the class. Uh, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Be safe, be healthy, be careful, and I will see you um, either online live or in the next video. Take care.